Today's scripture reading will come from John, chapter 15, verses 9 through 11. Again, the scripture reading will come from John, chapter 15, verses 9 through 11, where the Bible says, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. It's good to see all of you this morning. We are delighted that you're here. We have uh, attempted to spend some time looking at the emotions of Jesus. Last year, as you recall, as we got to this time of the year, when a lot of folks are thinking about Christ's birth, and what that means. We tried to seize that opportunity and we spent several weeks looking at who is this Jesus. So we didn't just think about the, the manger scene and the birth of Jesus, but what he was born for. The announcement was that this day is born unto thee in the city of David a Savior, Christ the Lord. And the bidding of the angels to the shepherds was there, is, there was good news for them of great joy. There were tidings that brought this message to them. And this year we've tried to not just look at who Jesus is, but how Jesus felt about things. He's a real person who lived here on this earth and he experienced those things that you and I experience. And this time of the year, emotions are significant, aren't they? Most of us probably look forward to celebratory times like this where families get together, but there are those when this is probably the most depressive time of the year for them. They dread it. They don't look forward to it. Maybe for a lot of different reasons, but it, it's not something that excites them. And their emotions are all out of kilter this time of the year. So it's important for us to, if we're going to think about Christ, is what was Christ's emotions like? You see, we can't forget that we are created beings and we're created in God's likeness. So every emotion we have, God provided for us. Now before we jump to conclusions, sometimes we have emotions that we shouldn't have because we've taken those emotions God did design and place within us that could be used and should be used appropriately and we use them inappropriately. And so they become something that God never intended for them to become. So since this particular passage that was read for us connects us in that last verse to what our first emotion was, joy. That the message was of great joy. And the essence of joy comes from God. There's reason to rejoice, to, to have joy. And Jesus says to the disciples, I want you to have my joy, the same joy that I have. That my joy not only might be in you, but that your joy might be full. So that's his desire. That's what he wants. That's why he came. But we can forfeit that. We can not see that. We cannot appreciate that. And we might never really embody that. But that's his desire. And then we looked at, he was a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. He had real emotions of, of sorrow. He felt our pain. He endured things that you and I endure. The song that we've just sung together expressed that, didn't it? Why did he come to earth? Why did he endure these things? Why did he experience these things? Because he loved us so. Last week we talked about that emotion of anger and tried to distinguish that that is an emotion that God places in us. That we can have righteous indignation, that we can be worked up or stirred up over things that are contrary to God's will. And when injustices come in this world, it, it bothers us and it enrages us. But that can be abused. The scriptures are filled with examples of, of that emotion being used as excuses for bad behavior or cruelty to others. We might even take on that mantra, well, I, I kind of have a short fuse and, and I'm just an angry person. Well, that's a choice. That's a decision. That emotion's there, but how we utilize it and how we recognize it and what we do with it is up to us. God's angry at sin. 
God's angry at what Satan has done to this world. God's expressed His anger, but we looked at last week and looking at Jesus, how He restrains His anger. We stood there for a while beneath the cross through the eye of faith, and, and we saw Him hanging on that cross, having endured all those things we just sung about, and He bore our stripes. He was a man of sorrow and a, acquainted with grief. And those who put Him there jeered Him on that cross. And Mark's account says that they said, If you be the Son of God, come down from the cross and we'll believe you. So they didn't just beat Him, they put Him there and mocked Him. Provoked him. But as he's hanging there, he looks down from the cross and hears that restrained anger. Father, forgive them, for they know not what to do. Now he'd already told his, his disciples earlier when they drew their swords and they wanted to fight for him, he said, Do you not know that I could petition the Father and he would send twelve legions of angels? Well, what would he send them for? To defend him. To carry out his anger, his wrath. Could have. But he restrained that anger and he came that we might have life and that we might be saved. And so he's hanging there seeing and hearing these things and yet he came that those people might be saved. That brings us then to this context that was read for us. For Jesus not only in verse 11 saying that he wanted their, his joy to be in them and for their joy to be full... But he'd started with them seeing the love of God. This emotion of love. Emotions are, are feelings. And again, these are, are things that God has placed in us that we can be touched by things. Things can be stirred in us and cause us to be real beings that recognize who God is and what God has done. So when you see that passage, it causes you to recognize that Jesus is having this conversation with them and he's saying, I want the kind of love that is in the Father and in me, also in you. Now, there are different words that can be used for love that all represent emotion. Eris is a, a term you often hear in our society where uh, people fall in love with each other. And they say, I love you. And, and that is a form of emotional love because they are physically attracted to someone else. That person's beautiful or attracted to them in some way and, and they love that person because of that person's appearance and it stirs that emotion in them. They're attracted to them. It's a real word. It's a real emotion. And God placed it there so we could be attractive to each other. In our Bible class, you were studying Old Testament Bible geography and you reviewed this morning in class about uh, uh, Isaac's in Rebecca sending back for a wife for Jacob. And when Jacob sees Rachel, he's attracted to her. He loves her immediately. We say love at first sight. He is physically attracted to her. Now, there are other women that he sees watering their, their flocks, but he is attracted to her. Not anything wrong with that unless that's mischanneled. And that, unless that emotion causes us to to gratify that attraction in some way that's contrary to God's will. Then there's story love, which is family love. That we love each other as a family. It's kind of built in. Our first experience of love is with our parents. We love our mother and father, and, and we learn how to say love and to feel love to our parents. And as parents, we love our children, and that's kind of built in, and that's an emotion that if it's not there, we have problems. In our society, we have some folks that don't love their children the way they should. That emotion is missing. Sometimes we put it in all kinds of complicated counseling context. Well, there's this uh, attachment disorder where they've never been loved, and so they don't know how to attach to people. So that emotion is important. You need to channel that correctly. And probably one of the most familiar words, emotions for love, is phileo. We have brotherly love. The Bible has a lot of examples, not only of family love, but we also have examples of, of this brotherly love. What stands out to us from an Old Testament standpoint would be 
the love that Jonathan and David had for each other. They adored each other as individuals, so much so that Jonathan wanted David to become king. Whereas Saul wanted Jonathan, his son, to be king, and, and God had forbade that. Jonathan was okay with that because of his love, his emotional attachment to David. And they fought the enemy together. They looked out for each other. That was an emotion that they felt very close to one another. Now that kind of love can, again, be mischanneled. And that can become a priority to us where we forfeit then other responsibilities to family, to God. Important. The one that Jesus is talking about here is the agape love. That is the deepest form of love, that, that the actions are going to be carried out in response to that emotion, whether there's a reciprocation for that love or not. That there's some responsibility, do you realize, that comes with that emotion. Now, he describes that here that first resided and abides with God. The broader context in John chapter 15 is Jesus talking about the vine and the branches. And obviously, Jesus is the vine, and we're the branches, His disciples. And we have to abide in Him, and our life source is in Him. So He created that image of us being dependent upon Him. Then He turns His attention to this emotion of love. And He describes that, as Zach read for us, that as the Father hath loved me, so I have loved him. Continue in my love. There's that emotion. It's my Father that loved me. The emotion's there. Now, agape love is, is identified because of his actions. So sometimes when people are defining uh, love and they get to agape, they say, well, it's not an emotional love. Well, what provokes the action? If there's not an emotion... If there's not a feeling, if there's not something stirred within us, what causes the action? So that agape love starts with God's love for us. And Jesus said, my Father loves me, and, and I love Him, and I want you to experience that kind of love. I want that to be an emotion that's part of you. That's important for all of us to to recognize. So we want to, in three perspectives this morning, first of all, to look at Jesus as the essence of love, that emotion. He's the very essence of it. So if we get that really good image of Christ, and since everybody's mind is thinking about Christ this time of the year, it's a great time to say, how did Christ feel while he was here? How does he feel now? What kind of emotions governed him and channeled his actions. And if there's any emotion that stands out most, it would be love. It's the very essence of it. Then we want to spend just a moment looking at the fact that Jesus expressed it. Sometimes people love, that is, they have an affection for someone else, but they find it really, really, really difficult to express it. Jesus expressed it. He expressed it in word and in deed. And that becomes important for us to look at. And then we'll conclude with Jesus being an example of love. That we see that that not just some uh, sugar-coated emotion, not some just verbalization is, that I love you. But he's a very example of the emotion of love. So we want to spend some time looking at it that way. And so when you see in this context was read for us from, from John chapter 15, he's the essence of it. Now he's talking about he and the Father, that they're one, and we know why. Because Jesus is God. In John chapter 1 and verse 1, he said, In the beginning was the Word, Word was with God, and the Word was God. By Him were all things made. Without Him was not anything made that was made. And the Word, who's God, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. 
And we beheld His glory, the, the glory the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, what did we behold? We behold His love, the emotion that He has for us. That deep affection that's willing to do for us what needs to be done. And in 1 John chapter 4, when John is writing to try to emphasize the importance of the love that we are to have for each other, and he's dealing with, with our uh, phileo love as well as our agape love in that context. But in 1 John chapter 4 and, and verse 8, it says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for... God is love. He's the very essence of love. To know God is to know love. And so if we really want to get a, a, an understanding of the emotion of love, then we have to know something about God. And in this context of, of 1 John 4, he's dealing with their relationship with each other and they can't hate their brother and say they love God. Because if that's the case, then they don't really know God. They, they're not really looking at the emotion that, that God represents. He is love. In verse 16 of that same chapter, he said, And we have, we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. There's the essence of it. The essence of love. And so when we are having conversation with folks this time of the year, and they're talking about the birth of Christ, it's a great time for us to relate these things about Jesus, the one who was born. And that He brought to us the very essence of love. And that's why in John chapter 3 and verse 16, we're able to, to see, since God is love, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Now there's the action part of it. But what motivated the action? What stirred the action? Is His love, His emotional agape love toward us. That that's how He felt about us. And He saw what our needs were and He provided for those needs. The very essence of that love. When you go back to the Gospel of John and, and chapter 5, and you specifically look at, at the context of, of verse 36 through 39, or really through 41, where Jesus is talking to those folks who are rejecting Him, and He reminds them that these are people who know the Scriptures. I mean, they are very averse at what the Old Testament Scripture said. In verse 39, He said, You search those Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. But when they testify of him, what do they testify of? When you look at verse 36, it says, But I have a greater witness than that of John, for the works that the Father hath given me to finish, the same works I do, and bear witness in me that the Father hath sent me. Now listen. And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me, and he hath neither heard, and you have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And you have not his word abiding in you. Listen carefully. You have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent him you believe not. Did you not believe in what I'm telling you? And that's why he said, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. In verse 40 he said, and, I, and ye will not uh, come to me that you might have life. The whole essence of him providing this for us is his love, because he's the essence of love. In Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23, it emphasizes to us and for us that Jesus is the fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy in Isaiah chapter 7. After having told Joseph not to fear to take Mary for his wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, he said, And he shall bear his son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And then verse 23 says, 
And in this is the scriptures fulfilled. You shall, call his, uh, you shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Ah, the very essence of the love of God is seen in Jesus coming and being our Savior. But we also understand that Jesus expresses love. He's not just love. He's not just the emotion of love, but he expresses that love. And going back to that context of, of John chapter 15, you drop down another verse from what Zach read for us. In verse 12 he said, And this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Now that gets put into context. How has he loved them? Well, he came so that they might have life, might have it more abundantly. He came that they might have joy, and their joy might be full. Now, they'll remember all these things after, after he's resurrected from the tomb. Oh, that's what all that meant. The brutality that he physically went through. The emotional trauma that was part of his in, in Gethsemane. Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. And he repeated that prayer three times. Yet he said, not my will, but thine be done. But why? Why was he willing after that prayer to go and let it be done? Because he loved us. That's how real that emotion is. And that's how it was expressed. When you look at passages like Romans chapter 5, you see how important that becomes. In fact, as you look in the book of John back earlier in chapter 11, that familiar story to us when Lazarus is sick and they send word to Jesus and said, your friend Lazarus is sick. And they said in that context, and Jesus echoed in that context, they said, Lazarus whom thou lovest. He expressed his love. They knew he had this emotional love for Lazarus. You remember the lady's going, and when he got there, Lazarus was dead. And in and, and chapter 11 and verse 34, he wanted to know where the tomb was. They carried him out to the tomb. And when Jesus got there, that infamous verse, 35, the shortest verse in the New Testament, and Jesus wept. But you know what the next verse says? These folks who came to comfort that family, Mary and Martha, when they saw Jesus weep, they said, Oh, how He loved Him. He expressed His love. The weeping over Lazarus expressed to those around Him, Oh, how He loved Him. He didn't hide His emotion of love that He had for Lazarus. Now, there were a lot of things, no doubt, involved in, in Jesus weeping. Because he knew he was going to raise Lazarus. But he also knew the pain that death was going to cause. And he also knew that Lazarus would physically die again. And that this pain would be experienced all over again. But his love was expressed so people could see it. Sometimes our love never really gets expressed. Like, well... I told you I love you. If I change my mind, I'll let you know, kind of thing. You know, that, that emotion has to be our essence. That's who we are. That same kind of emotions in us that's in Christ and, and in the Father, that it's real. It, it stirs us, but it stirs us to action so that we do what needs to be done for each other. And we do what needs to be done for the Lord because we love Him. And that emotion is seen in Christ. We'll talk about it from our vantage point this evening. And we'll look at that love that never fails. And the context of that love. But we want to look at Jesus being the example of how that emotional love can be expressed. We mentioned already from Romans chapter 5 and never did get there. So we'll get there now. In Romans chapter 5... Beginning at verse 5, it says, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God 
is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. So what is that emotion, that real agape love, what does it do? How can it be recognized? The fact that Jesus loved us is expressed, verbally is expressed. Recorded that He loved us. That's why He came. And He wanted them to have that same kind of love for each other. And then verse 7 said, But scarcely for a righteous man would one die, yet preadventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. Now here it is. But God commended His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now that's John 3 and 16. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Here's Paul reminding us that here's how God demonstrated, commanded His love toward us. While we were still sinners. It wasn't dependent upon us reciprocating that love. It was the only means of our salvation. And that emotion that he had of of our care, of of our well-being, was stirred to action. And that's how it's demonstrated. He's an example of it to provide for us an understanding of that emotion of love. Verse 9 says, Much more then, being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through Him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received atonement. No question of Jesus experiencing love. That that emotion was who He was, is, shall be. And it was demonstrated to us while we were yet sinners, He demonstrated, here's a means for you to be reconciled to God. That God of love, who is love, for you to be reconciled to Him, brought back to Him, even though in our unloving condition of sin, He provided the means for that to be corrected, for atonement to be made, for the price to be paid. Now that's the emotion of love. And that's an emotion that represents Jesus. Since that's the case, What is your attitude toward Jesus? Do you have that emotional attraction to Him? That you would see and visualize what He's done for you? That you'd love Him in return? Would it stir that emotion in you? You see, we have all kinds of artist depictions of what Jesus is, and and it's going to look like we want Him to look. If I'm a Caucasian person, then Jesus is going to look like me. So I can kind of relate to that. If I'm uh, of another ethnicity, then if I'm going to get an image of Jesus, then that picture is going to have to have my skin color and and my hair uh, uh, texture and those kind of things, so I can kind of relate to that. You see, we're talking about something deeper than the physical appearance. We can be physically attracted to someone and really not love them. They might just provide something we, we want. But you see, it wasn't really anything we could provide for the Lord, but He loved us. Do you love Him in return? Since you know that He died for you, that, that you might be reconciled to God, do you want to be reconciled to God? You see, if you do, then Jesus said, You search those scriptures, and them, you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And those scriptures record that Jesus said, If you believe not that I am He, you will die in your sin. Now, His love doesn't want you to die in your sin. His love provided atonement for your sins. But then it becomes our choice. What emotion stirred in us? Do we love Him? Be willing to acknowledge that He is the Son of God? He said, 
I tell you, tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Luke chapter 13, verse 3. He doesn't want us to perish. His love provided a means for us not to perish. What's our response? Do we love in return and repent of our sins? He says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, He that confesseth me before man, him will I confess before my Father who art in heaven. Ah, oh, who is the Father in heaven? The very essence of love. That He gave His only begotten Son, and His Son provided the means of my atonement. Am I willing to confess that? I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Does that love stir in me that way? Then He sent a common message to all the world. He has all authority and all power. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18. All authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. The one who loves us is the essence of love, who has expressed that love, who is the example of love. He has all authority and all power. He said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Those are not burdensome commandments. They are expressions of God's love that will lead us to salvation eternally. That's who Jesus is. That's how Jesus feels. How do you feel about Him? We're told in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. The question would be why? Because He loves us. His emotions are, emotions are stirred toward us. Why would I confess my sins? Because I love Him. And I want my sins removed and I want to demonstrate my love for Him. Can we help you do that this morning? While together we stand and while we sing.